All right, and we're back. <laughs> we're gonna stick around in the heat, and we're gonna go into a taste of Amazonia through this next talk. I was transported a couple of times uh, when I had a call with Edu um, a while back, and uh, <laughs> and uh, people haven't seen each other in a long time, so there's also a reconvergence point happening at Boom, um, which is really nice, and I sure, I'm sure it's happening for people here as well. So we're gonna dive into the fusion of ancient indigenous wisdom and modern science in psychedelic research. Um, Eduardo Schenberg is a neuroscientist and a psychopharmacologist and has quite a few interesting thoughts to share on the matter. Um, he has some inputs, but he also invites conversation at any point. So you don't need to leave your question towards the end. If you think something that is moving you and getting you enthusiastic and you want to know it now and you think it's relevant in that moment also for the room, do that little additional processing, it's useful. Feel free to lift, raise your hand um, and ask a question. So let's invite Eduardo onto the stage. A nice warm welcome, please. And, uh, and I'm going to get you your chair. <laughs> yeah, Walk, my chair, my chair. Hello, everyone. Hey, beautiful crowd, beautiful boomers. Amazing event. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, it's really a pleasure. I was kind of last night, I was tripping <laughs> and thinking, how the hell am I going to tell the story? <laughs> and, and I, oh, yay. Thank you. Yeah, now, now, now I'm here. And I, I was like, how am I going to tell this story? Like, there are so many ways I could, I could start from. And I was kind of seeing so many stuff going around at night, at boom, and day. And I was like, wow, there are so many, so many ways to spend 24 hours at boom, and so many ways for me to tell this story. And, and then my idea was like, I don't want to do this a monologue. I just don't want to be sitting here and talking and talking and talking and telling a lot of stuff. So please, really feel free uh, to raise your hand and bring some question or observation or challenge me or provoke or agree, whatever it is, uh, at basically any time point. Uh, and that's fine. Also, most of all, what I want to share I'll try to do it in English, and I hope you can follow my English. At some points, I may ask for some help if I miss some words. And I'm going to start in Portuguese, but then the same thing I'm going to tell in Portuguese, I'm going to read again in English. But that felt to me like the, the best starting point for the conversation. So these words are not mine. And I'm going to tell later uh, who, who's the author, wh where do these words come from. But these are words that touch me deeply. And they've been touching deeply to more and more people over about the last 10 years. And they come from about 20 years of analog recordings in the Amazon that later became um, a kind of mind-blowing, life-changing book, which is out there and I can talk about later. So here's what he says, and I'll do it in Portuguese first. A floresta está viva. Ela só vai morrer se os brancos insistirem em destruí-la. Se conseguirem, os rios vão desaparecer debaixo da terra. O chão vai se desfazer. As árvores vão murchar. E as pedras vão rachar no calor. A terra ressecada ficará vazia e silenciosa. Os espíritos chapiri que descem da montanha 
para brincar em seus espelhos, fugirão para muito, muito longe. Seus pais, os xamãs, não poderão mais chamá-los e fazê-los dançar e nos proteger. Não serão capazes de espantar as fumaças de epidemia que nos devoram. Fumaças de epidemia que nos devoram. Não conseguirão mais manter os seres maléficos que transformarão a floresta num caos. Então, morreremos. Um atrás dos outros. E todos morreremos. Tanto os brancos como nós. Todos os xamãs vão acabar morrendo. Quando não houver mais nenhum xamã para sustentar o céu, ele vai desabar. I'll try this in English now, and I'm translating because the text is only in Portuguese. The forest is alive. It will only die if the white people insist in destroying it. If they succeed, the rivers will disappear below the ground. The earth will collapse. The trees will murchar. That <laughs> the trees will just go down and the rocks will collapse, will crack, will crack in the heat. The rocks will crack in the heat. The earth will be dry and silent. The Shapiri spirits who come down from the mountain to play in their mirrors will run far, far, far away. Their fathers, the shamans, will not be capable anymore to call them to dance and protect us. They will not be able anymore to put away the epidemic smoke which devour us, which eat us. They will not be able to maintain the evil beings away and the forest will become chaos. After that, we're gonna die. One after the other. We're all gonna die. The white people and ourselves. All the shamans are gonna die. And when there are no shamans anymore to sustain the sky, the sky will fall. So let's take a pause to Let it sink in. What is coming through these words? That we're all gonna die and that the water is going away and that it's becoming so fucking heat and warm that the rocks are gonna crack. Now let's take a pause and ponder a bit about where are we and when are we. We are in a planet of 4.5 billion years old. And that may seem trivial. Of course, we can talk about 
dozens and hundreds and thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions and billions and trillions. Well, what the fuck does it mean? What's the difference between a million and a billion? And we don't really grasp it. We can't see. If we think about a, a line, most of us, if we're asked, to put a pin in a line, where's a thousand, where's a million, where's a billion, we get it totally wrong. We don't really, we, I mean, we can make this kind of stuff, we can have the machines to calculate for us, but when it's about us figuring out these big numbers, we get lost and they get, they kind of lose meaning. So I'm going to try to give you guys a sense of what 4.5 billion years is since the dance tempo started a little bit more than 24 hours ago. So if the planet had started at that time, like 24 hours ago, at 4 a.m., so it starts at midnight, and we go like 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m., and then we get the first single cell, the first single living thing at 4 a.m. Before that, it was kind of thunder, and volcanoes and storms and toxins and stuff. Not a single cell could live here. As most likely in all other planets we can reach out for, no single cell apparently can be alive. But at 4 a.m. here, something happens and life begins. And then we go 5 and 6 and 7 and 8 and 10 a.m. And about 10 a.m. something brutal happens, which is oxygen. These first life creatures from 4 a.m. up to 10 a.m., they started shaping and changing the atmosphere of the planet with wherever they were exchanging inside the cells and outside the cells, and they made oxygen at 10 a.m. At 11 a.m., we had dinosaurs walking around in one fucking hour, huge creatures that we all love to see the bones and the stuff and imagine how they looked like and how could it be if we were living together with them, right? That's 11 a.m. Now my first question, if anybody wants to join the conversation, if anybody has a guess, in these 24 hours, what time did we arrive here? Anybody else? Two seconds before midnight, 23.59. You guys are good. Boomers. Boomers. We're fucking recent here. We arrived at about the last minute or the last 30 seconds of the 24 hours of the whole planet. Another way to put this is if the planet started here at my shoulder, Animals arrived here at my hand, dinosaurs here at my finger, and us at the tip of our nails. Please look at your nails. Look at them. Really at the tip. Maybe it's dirty like mine a bit from booming around. And it's really thin. Maybe it's long and painted and you can't really see what's going on there. Right? But it's really thin. And now look the whole way down. There's a lot of stuff going on. 
a lot of stuff going on before we got here. Please. Awesome, thank you. So the question is pretty much if I'm saying that we're very recent and that we're all gonna die, that there is this loop. Evolution is about loops and species come and go. And is this just how it is or should we do something about it? Is this pretty much? So I'd like to take a split from your question. I am not saying we're all gonna die. I was reading a prophecy from the Amazon. And then I, I took a break and I'm bringing you another vision, which is the vision I was taught about what this planet is about, which is the scientific story. How the hell do we know it's like 4.5 billion years and all the stuff that I was talking about, right? This is like science. Science like this crazy stuff, really crazy stuff, that people get to measure things in, in stuff that we usually would not imagine, in a piece of dirt, of earth, or of old fragment of bone, or a lost fragment of a teeth of a hominid, and we can, nowadays, we can guess if it was a woman or a man or a lot of things, right? So we have this story of 4.5 billion years. We have other stories around of seven days and others and others and many stories. And what I've been working about in the past few years is to try and see if these stories have anything in common or are they all like crazy different incompatible myths each one with their craziness and nothing matches with anything or is there something that we can kind of see that goes together and align between very different kinds of stories okay so to get back to your question, I'm not saying we're all gonna die, although we are, because of course, one of the very, <laughs> one of the very certainties we have is that we're gonna die at some point. Some people disagree. They think that through technology and manipulating the DNA and the genome, they can live forever. And I'm bothered by that, because my question is, wouldn't, wouldn't you ever leave space for the young folks who are playing dragons down there at the top of Boom, if we don't go away, how would there be space for newcomers? And if everybody were still here, how many millions we would be packed here? Too many, right? So there is a turnover, but at the same time, is there a turnover for the human species? That's a key part of, of the conversation uh, that I wanna have today with you guys. Hi. Hey. Um, so you were saying that, very interesting conversation and, and, and reading that you gave us. Um, but you say if human race is going to it's going to die and it's going to evolve to the next thing. What is the next thing? The next thing is... How can I know? <laughs> what will you guess? Do you, well, I honestly believe that AI, it's a logical step. But then, is it biological being who continue here? Or maybe it will just be, I don't know, transfer the consciousness somewhere else? I, I honestly don't know. I think anybody who pretends to know is pretending because we can't really see the future or know the future except perhaps in very rare circumstances which are connected to this text that I just read from the Amazon. But the point to me is not what's coming after, it's what we're doing now. And I think both are connected. 
what will come after will critically depend on what we do now. Then the next step of the story, the scientific story, full of numbers and stuff, that usually give us certainty, right? When, when we hear most of us, not everybody, but most of us were already schooled in a way that kind of science is the true story. What science tells is true, right? And if it's 4.5 billion years, you gotta make sense of it somehow and agree and accept that it's 4.5. Or if it's seven or eight or one million, right? And then when you go deep into it, you start seeing that, wow, there are lots of stuff here for people to claim it's 4.5 billion. And then the more you go, the more you agree and trust it, right? And then what's going on now is that it's really hot. I think now here it's a place that we can talk about the rocks cracking in the heat and many people will kind of yeah, that maybe that's possible, man. <laughs> I was sitting in that rock last afternoon and it was so hot. <laughs> it could really crack, right? It's like 40 something yesterday, 46 some people said, I don't really know. It's really hot, I, I was feeling dumb. I was kind of, wow, I gotta give a talk tomorrow and it's so hot and luckily today it's a, a little bit less, right? And this is, the, how do we say, um, fresco, comfortável? Fresh, thank you. This is the freshest boom we're gonna ever enjoy. Because next year or after that, it's not gonna be 46, it's gonna be 48, it's gonna be 50. And our body temperature is 37. Anything above 37, we start to malfunction. We start to overheat and we really get dumb. We get less oxygen in our brains and our cells don't function and our liver doesn't metabolize stuff and we have problems eating and, and just being alive. And that's the direction we're going because we have put so much CO2 in the atmosphere. So right back there, when oxygen started, for millions of years, we had a stable atmosphere where living creatures in the planet were exchanging oxygen and CO2 in many different complex ways, like micro invisible creatures, big plants, whales, monkeys, all kinds of creatures. Plants, trees, oaks, fungi, everybody were kind of doing their thing, but the overall was stability. And then I was talking about the tip of our nails or the last minute or the last half minute or when sapiens come into the planet. This last part is 200,000 years, which is still a very, very, very long time. We don't even get to live to 100, right? Hoffman did. <laughs> we don't really know how he managed, <laughs> but he did. But very few of us do. So we, we have difficulties as well thinking about 200,000 years. And 200,000 years is the scientific estimate for the Homo sapiens species, us, right? But us, like we are now, talking with microphones, smartphones, boom festivals, internet. Last night we were dancing and somebody said about something going online and I was like, online, what the fuck is that? <laughs> we're all here. <laughs> what else there is, right? besides us being here, that's, isn't that all there is? And we, as, as a group, as a uh, kind of identity, I, I'd like to propose that we have 200 years of existence. 
our so-called culture or our way of life is 200 years old, like two centuries. That's the Industrial Revolution. That's when some crazy folks started electricity. And they just said, man, I'm done with fire all the time. I'm burning my hands and oil and all this smell and smoke in my house and stuff and things burn. I want something better. And they just went there and they did electricity. And it's like fucking fascinating. Look this behind me. It's like behind that is a crazy lots of cables and stuff. Many, many screens. Like amazing technology. I love it, right? That's 200 years old. In, in 200 years, we, we get this stuff. And we're touching it hundreds of times a day. Sometimes to work. Other times to distract ourselves. Many times we don't fucking know why we're touching the screen. We're just doing it, right? It's like, like smokers. They, they just put their hands in the pockets and they get the cigarettes and they play with the cigarettes. Sometimes they don't light it up. My, my grandpa did a lot of that. He would usually burn the cigarette upside down and he would throw away by like his last, last months. So we have all these kind of computer-like behaviors, right? When we are not really aware and conscious and paying attention to what we're doing. And that's key to what I'm trying to say here. Since the start of the Industrial Revolution, Homo sapiens kind of changed. We changed in many fundamental ways. We now have clothes, we have shelter, we have stuff to warm ourselves when it's cold. We have stuff to cool us down when it's too hot. I was also dancing here at Boom and thinking about Dubai. And I was thinking if these guys are going to build a huge dome around all Boom land and put air conditioning on the whole thing <laughs> in a few years to come, right? There is technology to do that. People do that in Dubai. They, they, Air conditioning entire soccer stadiums for 80,000 people. And it's 48 Celsius out there, and people are dying in the heat. And then, then if we go back 30 years, 1992, I was 12. There was this massive event in Rio, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, called Echo 92, a massive gathering of people already aware of climate change, already aware that the planet was heating up, and that something needed to be done. That was 30 years ago. The first scientific conference on climate change happened in 1979, the year I was born. People already knew, and they knew before then. And they knew it, and they were exchanging, and then they managed to do a conference about it, to discuss it. This thing is gonna heat up, and that's bad for us, right? And then why is it heating up, right? Most of you guys probably know why it's heating up. It's heating up because we burn too much fossil fuels, mostly the oil industry, and it's pumping too much CO2 into the atmosphere, and CO2 makes this kind of top layer on the sky, and it keeps the heat inside. The heat that comes from the sun comes in, but when it's going up again, it hits the CO2 molecules, and it goes back down. And then it tries to go up again, and it hits too many CO2 molecules, and it comes down again. It's like a stufa, we say in Portuguese. A place you want to heat up for certain plants. Yeah, so what's the name of that? Greenhouse. Greenhouse. That's not a good name. In English, it's, uh, <laughs> I don't like it. It's uh, like a heat house or something like that. It's better, right? It's to make it, it's like a sauna, right? It's a temascal. We are building a temascal on a planetary scale. And then there in 1992, 
the then president of the United States of America, one of the most CO2 pumping people in the planet, he said the following, while discussing with environmentalists. And he said, our way of life is non-negotiable. Like they're not willing to discuss. The American dream will go on. Suffer whoever will need to suffer. And that's a lied statement. 200 years before that, Simon Bolivar, one of the most brutal colonizers of South America, he said, we will do this. And if nature disagree, we're gonna force it to do what we want. So this is going for a long, long time. Most of us inherited and were taught and learned about progress and development, right? These, these words, they sound so beautiful. They're on the newspapers and presidents and governors and mayors and everybody's talking about it, right? We gotta develop and we gotta develop the underdeveloped world underdeveloped world. We created all these kinds of distinctions between those who are kind of developed, they, they evolved maybe, would be a better word, and those who are still kind of primates, I don't know, what's the best word? It's like primitivus, primitive, right? Primitive, thank you. And then we, we create these kind of splits there are the primitives, and there are us. <laughs> and we are fine, and we are good, because we know, we buy, we have stuff, right? And if it's too, too warm, I, I will turn some gadget to cool it down. And those guys don't know. And then, and then the point is, why am I talking with you guys here? I was asking this question myself many, many times. And, and this is a good time to start thanking Ivan and Chiara and Nena and Renata and other folks for just saying Edu should try and give a talk at, at the Liminal Village. It's now 22 years since I first tried Hoffman's Potion. And woo! And, and when I did that, my whole, my whole schooling collapsed. My whole, my whole arrogance and knowledge and thinking and internal speech, everything just collapsed. It was meaningless. All of a sudden, in like a few hours, all of this stuff, I was already studying to become a scientist and full of information and numbers and ah, and everything just like blah. And what's going on here, right? And it was like life was going on. And I was breathing and I was feeling stuff and I could look at my veins and I was fascinated. Like, look at all that's going on in myself right now and I, I have no idea how it happens. I don't control it, it is just going on. And I was a baby and, and it just happens and I'll be old and I'll be weak and I'll be, I know, it's like classic acid trip, right? <laughs> kind of, you've been there, I hope. <laughs> and then a bit after that, um, I went to a place that I don't like going at all. So I was born in Brazil, but my, my surname Schemberg is not Brazilian at all. It's nothing Brazilian about it. It's come from Germany. I was born there because the father of my grandfather was running from the war. Because if he didn't do that, he would have been killed in the Nazi camps and I wouldn't be here. And luckily he succeeded 
And he went to Brazil and they made family there and they had kids and kids and kids and here I am. But I was raised with this thing about, like my family has a story of big, big heads in science in Brazil, but I'm not gonna go into that. Uh, so I was raised like science is an amazing thing. And if you wanna like go with your curiosity about everything, just go and study science, whatever it is, engineering, biology, whatever you want. And I was like, wow, biology is the stuff. But there was this, you know, like ancestry connected with Jewish culture and extermination, Nazi camps, and this thing kind of got to me. And on my mom's side, it was Catholic, Christian stuff, Jesus on the wall, but not, not really, like, nobody went to the church on Sundays and so on. So I was raised, like, not really liking religion. Nobody could explain to me religion very much. And then at about 20 years old, I went to a church in Brazil. And I went to this church, and churches were places I've been, I had visited before for a wedding, a funeral, or something very, very boring. Mostly as a kid, and I felt like terrible, like I can't be a kid here, they, 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 they don't like kids. They don't like me, I can't, you know, like I can't just be joyous here. It's serious, you know, silent and deep stuff. And then I go to this church, and they hand me a glass of these kind of green juice that people call a tea. I don't like saying it's a tea because tea is like chamomile, you know, like it's something really soft that doesn't do much. I mean, it may help you sleep or I like black tea as well. It's like, you know, caffeine. Jack was talking a lot about caffeine. Jack, if you're here, I love caffeine. <laughs> but I, I got this green juice from the Amazon commonly called ayahuasca. These folks called it Santo Daimi, which is like the saint givers or, or a, holy, a holy gift maybe would be a nice translation. And I took this and I shaked like crazy and I was so scared and I was so cold for I don't know how long, very, very long. I was just shaking and trembling and sweating and cold and then somebody just put a hand on my shoulder and said breathe in and put your head up and try to see it and then everything changed and again I had I had an experience like unbelievable kind of stuff and I went out of the church and and there was these these woods around and I could see and feel the trees, the trunk of the trees were like people just breathing slowly. And I could see the fog kind of following the movement. And I felt like the whole thing was breathing with me and I could hug the tree like I can hug one of you guys and just breathe together and, and feeling it coming in and out. It was a fucking tree, it's not happening. And then my science mind just like, wow, that's an hallucination, man, you're tripping. You know, it's not happening, it's not true. And then I, I, I got out of that, that experience, very puzzled. I was very puzzled by, by two things. A lot of other stuff happened. But I don't want to go too much and too long into this experience. But I came out of it first fascinated that I didn't know the universe menu had those kind of options, you know, like, oh, you're alive here and you can choose this, this stuff for dinner. Like, wow, nobody told me. <laughs> and at the same time, I went back to the university. I was, I was studying biomedicine in the biggest Brazilian university. I had access to the biggest biomedical library in the South America. We didn't have PDFs by that, that time very much. So I would go to the library and I would get, you know, like 
the scientific journals in print and check one article and take a photocopy and take the photocopy home to study it. And then I started searching for Santo Daime, for LSD and psychedelics. And there was absolutely nothing. Nothing. Zero. I had classes about caffeine, amphetamine, opioids, all kinds of drugs. I was studying psychopharmacology, pharmacology, toxicology, genetics. But LSD was not there. It, I mean, if you found it, you would find like half a paragraph, like, oh, a crazy drug from the hippies which can change your chromosomes, which is that stuff from the old 60s, right? But then I said, this can't be, right? I mean, Brazil, this is not illegal. It's not because of being illegal. Ayahuasca is not illegal. This church is going on. People are drinking it. They're doing this. It's a cultural movement. It's a religious thing. It's available. I went there. I can go again. But of course, this thing gets into the brain, and I want to study it. I want to understand what does it do to the brain? Is it relevant in any way? And there was almost nothing going on. And then I started making friendships with anthropologists and historians, and they have a lot to tell. It was fascinating. All kinds of books and stuff. And then through these books and stories, I started connecting with indigenous people. And then I learned, wow, ayahuasca is not a religion. And with all due respect, I don't like the church, so I want to try this out of the church. And then I started searching where there is an indigenous guy. <laughs> And I want to try this thing. I want to do this their way, right? And then many things happened over, over these 22 years that I was talking about since I, I first tried psychedelics. And I got really involved with indigenous people, mostly in Brazil, but not only. And I went to visit them, and I took ayahuasca with them, and we went to Mexico, and we had the Neo Santos, the, the sacred mushrooms, the Telnanacatl, the, the magic mushrooms, in Walta de Jimenez, which is the town of Maria Sabina, the lady who introduced the mushrooms for a white banker from New York who introduced the mushrooms to Terence McKenna and all of us, right? Uh, and we went there, and we were kind of listening, and we were, we were kind of going to festivals and taking the synthetics and doing parties, but also going to the indigenous traditions and hearing the prayers and listening and learning with them how they do this in connection with nature. But they don't even know what nature is. Like my favorite philosopher alive these days is called Ailton Krenak. Ailton is a very important figure in Brazilian culture and policy and politics these days. And Ailton says to us, I don't see nature anywhere. Everything just is. And we are part of it. Right? And, and we have this strong tendency to think about nature and us. And we call the stuff we do, we call it synthetic. Like we say LSD is synthetic or semi-synthetic because a guy made it. It's not from nature. Right? It's not a plant or a fungi or a toad who gave us this molecule. It was a primate, a monkey, a guy. But isn't a guy again nature? I have a friend that he says LSD is fascinating for many reasons. And one of them is because it's the only psychedelic made by a primate. <laughs> and it's natural as well, right? So it's, it's so close to the fungi molecule and so on. And then we all have these now, nowadays that all this psychedelic talk is getting so big. And we're talking about psychedelics for depression psychedelic therapy for PTSD, right? We're talking about psychedelic drugs for drug addiction, like, like stop doing too much cocaine or alcohol or 
opiates, get some ketamine or get some ibogaine. I studied ibogaine. I interviewed lots of folks using ibogaine to quit crack cocaine and amazing stories. There was one guy who had this question. By the end of the interview, I asked him, why do you think ibogaine helped you quit this 10 or 5 or 20 year old addiction? And the guy laughed a bit and he said, well, you're a scientist and you're not going to believe me, but since you ask, I'm going to tell you the truth. And the truth is that ibogaine brought my spirit to Africa, to Gabon. When I was in this shamanism kind of drumming thing ritual, and they healed me there, and then my spirit traveled back to my body in this hospital bed. And then after my ibogaine experience, I went to Google. When I Googled iboga, and I saw this video of these black people dancing and drumming exactly like I had seen my experience. And I have never, I swear to you, doctor, I never saw this, those images before. And I was like, wow, okay. I'm gonna try to put this in my scientific paper. <laughs> and then the editors go about, no, you can't, no, 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 no. This part you gotta, you know, like, we have space limitations, so <laughs> leave this part out because it doesn't fit the scientific story. And this is what brings me back to David Kopenawa's words, which is the words from the beginning, from the we're all gonna die and the rocks are gonna crack in, in the heat and the rivers are gonna dry if and this is a big if. We're not saying we're all gonna die. We're gonna say, if we continue to fuck everything around, then yeah, we're all gonna die. And we are not just all gonna die old and tired. We're gonna suffer. This death he's saying here, it's a difficult one. It's, it's scary stuff. This part that I read comes from a book, a game by this guy, a Yanomami, shaman from the north north northwestern amazon in brazil near venezuela davi copenawa and davi is one of the guys that more and more i'm talking about that we should speak about in brazil and south america as a kind of dalai lama we have a few of them dalai lamas from the forest the dalai lama is this wise guy beautiful soul and heart who comes from the mountains in the east in Asia and Tibet right that everybody knows but almost no one hears about the Dalai Lamas of the forest and their spirituality and their religion is illegal and people are persecuted by doing what they do the Yanomami are not particularly into ayahuasca like the beverage but they have this snuff powder that they blow with like two meters or more. Maybe this distance that we are here. And one guy blows in this tube into the nostril of the other one. And this powder contains DMT, we know that. And these words come from his book with a French anthropologist, Bruce Alberts, which is called The Falling Sky, A Queda do Céu which I highly, highly, highly recommend as a reading. It's an amazing book, it's enjoyable, it's challenging, it's provocative and difficult, and it's beautiful at many different parts. It has three main sections. And Davi, the Yanomami, they were contacted by white guys like us, the industrial folks, about 50 years ago. 50 years ago. They have kids at around 16 to 20, the first kid. 16 years old, girls are getting moms for the first time, right? So in 50 years, you have three or four generations of Yanomami. And in three or four generations of Yanomami people, they have survived five or six COVID epidemics in 50 years, 
We are tired and scared of two years of COVID. But they got all kinds of things that I don't know the names in English, but smallpox and, you know, like all kinds of viruses and stuff that white people bring to the forest together with Christianity and the ideas that the Shapiri, that he says, the Shapiri is some kind of thing that we don't really understand, we don't really know, and we translate as spirits. But take a lot of care with that word because it's not a Yanomami word. It's our word. And from a scientific perspective, when I try to discuss the Yanomami stuff with scientists, they say it doesn't exist. We already know that spirits don't exist. Just matter and energy exist. And we can measure and calculate everything. And that's everything. But then... Then we enter a psychedelic trip. And what is it that we see? And what is it that we feel? Right? And this is to me something fascinating because if we go a few decades back, we didn't know about x-rays. And now we can use x-rays in hospitals and we can see broken bones and do useful stuff with it. And we also didn't know about radioactivity. And now we learn to do lots of useful and dangerous things with radioactivity, right? So when science can measure, we start talking about that it's real. But the trick is it has always been there. We just didn't know about it, but we didn't invent x-rays, and we didn't invent radioactivity. It's there, it happens, right? It comes from the space, it comes from certain materials in this planet that emit radioactivity. And people were so fascinated, they were carrying it in their pockets and they got sick because it causes all kinds of problems in our cells if you're uh, exposed to it in, you know, like high frequency and quantity and so on. And in the psychedelic space, we have the reverse. Think about that, it's the reverse. Science cannot measure your trip. No one can screen capture <laughs> your dreams or your psychedelic visions. And you cannot show that to anyone else. You cannot share it. It's totally personal. We used to say it's inside. But it's a very nice question like, I have opened skulls, I have done neurosurgery, not in people, but in what we call lab animals, and then I dropped it because I felt like these animals are suffering and maybe this is not necessary and so on, but I did that. I saw brains pulsating with, you know, like the blood vessels, the brain is not fixed there, the brain is moving. You open a window and the brain is moving, and we can put electrodes and we can record the electrical signals from the neurons and stuff. And now people like Jack and many other friends around, and, and, and they're testing these in animals, and now we can put electrodes in our own heads, and I did that. I put electrodes in my own head, and I took ayahuasca in Brazil, and I got my own brain waves recorded. And I had 20 other crazy folks do that as well. <laughs> and we tried to understand what is ayahuasca doing to the brain. But nothing of it carries an inch closer to the experience each user has. The insights, the emotional experience, the transformative experience, the visions. Only those who take it can know that it's there and it exists. And those who don't take are skeptical and saying, oh, it's, they're saying all kinds of stuff, right? <laughs> you probably heard some of this stuff around. Psychiatrists still like to say it's a uh, psychotic reaction, a hallucination, an illusion, you're seeing things which are not there. What does David Kopenawa say? David Kopenawa was, when he was a kid, his father died. And a bit after that, because of all these COVID kind of bugs that were ravaging his people, like killing, like, 50% of the population every five years. 
or less. And in between the newcomers, there were a lot of Catholic people preaching about Dios, God, mostly in Spanish. And Davi understands in his own Yanomami's speech as Teosi. And there's a lot of this in the book. And he spent decades asking about to everybody who came there if they ever, for at least a single brief moment, if they saw God. And he never heard a yes over decades and decades and decades. And they are saying that his chapiri do not exist and only this Christian God exists and it's out there and they gotta drop everything. They gotta stop ayahuasca and, and, and they gotta stop the hape and the, the, the powders that they blow and all their culture and many tribes did that. We're now seeing in Brazil a cultural revival where tribes who had completely lost these traditions, they are relearning the traditions from those who were deeper in the forest and far away from the cities. The closer from the cities, the more they lost. They were watching television, they were having cachaça or it's similar to vodka, and they were reading the Bible and they were losing their own language. And then these old guys came from the deep of the forest and they, they just said, stop that. Look at what's going on. You're fighting. You are like your tribe is aggressive. The women are sick. People are weak. You're not building stuff anymore. Just drop the TV, drop these drinks. Relearn to use ayahuasca, relearn your language. And then I, I was among the Puyanawa in Acre, in the West, West, like some states in the south of Brazil, they play like, do Acre really exist? It's so far out. It's, it's in the border with Peru, in the northwestern Amazon. And I've been there with the Puyanawa, and the Puyanawa have recovered ayahuasca 15 years ago from the Ashaninka and the Hunikuin. And when they recovered ayahuasca, they discovered that the old 90 year old, six ladies in the tribe who didn't speak anything else for five years. They were mute for five years, just eating and doing some things. Very old ladies in the Amazon, never had a doctor, toothpaste, nothing. South, just living there. And they were mute. And then after ayahuasca, when they heard the songs, they started singing in a language that nobody knew. And they started teaching the Puyanawas again their own language at 90 something years old. And now there's all this cultural revival. So when I come here and I want to honor and thank everybody working at Boom because I am amazed that so many people can be here and the place is clean. There are no chemical toilets. There's no like huge garbage. Everything's compostable. We are almost living in an ecotopia outside of the oil age, but we're still suffering with the 46 degrees heat, right? And this is the theme of the festival. The Anthropocene, right? You probably saw it on the website, I hope so. And what is the Anthropocene? Anyone want to exchange ideas? Hi, hello, thank hello. you for your talk. Uh, I'm Greek, so the word itself is very Greek, Anthropo and the scene, the effect of humans on the planet. Anthropos is person, human. So each individual identity and their own effect on the planet. So it doesn't have to be just a whole, but individual. Amazing, amazing, thank you. This, pesta, this, Christos, to me pesta. <laughs> this, this, 
you know, like the, this global village of boom, right? Greeks and Argentinians and Israelis and everybody. I love it, right? So that's, I, I couldn't explain better, right? The Anthropocene is kind of the age of Homo sapiens. So we have changed the planet so much that for about, I don't remember if, it's about 20 years, maybe less than 20, 15 years or so, some guys proposed this new word, Anthropocene, right? It's a new age. It's not a new age of the 60s hippies. It's a new geological age. We have gone through very different geological ages. There's the Ice Age that we watch on Pixar and we laugh. And there are volcanoes and all kinds of stuff and all kinds of hominids, right? The, the planet, 4.5 billion years, it went through a lot of stuff. And now at the fingertip of our nails, this last 200,000 years, and most precisely the last 200 years, like a second of the 24 hours of our story of planet Earth, we created the Anthropocene, which is the geological age where we humans change the planet to a scale that the planet is not the same anymore. And apparently we are the first species able to do that and know that we're doing that. And then there's all kinds of discussions. P some people are saying that maybe we should drop the word Anthropocene because not everybody's to blame the same, right? So I was talking about CO2, scientists can like there's stuff flying way above us, like satellites kind of stuff. There's internet bots flying around. There is even, there's even trash flying around us above the atmosphere. There, there's danger. When you, when you rocket launch these days, you gotta calculate not to hit trash. We created a an, an sphere of trash around the planet, just floating bits of spaceships and junk space junk and then they say not everybody's to blame the same right and then if we calculate stuff we can see that china and the us and germany and this and that country they they do this much more than other folks like the boga healers in gabon they are not pumping co2 into the planet Davi Kopenawas, Yonomamis, and the Honey Queens, and the Puyanawas, and the Shawanawas, and the Guaranis, and the Tupis, and, and, and the traditions from New Zealand, and all around, and, and Asia, and Africa. These folks are not pumping CO2. They are not dumping oil. They are not burning stuff. They're just doing their small fires. And if you do a small fire, don't worry. You're not contributing to climate change. Because it's on a massive scale. Remember what I was saying about hundreds, thousands, millions, and billions. We, we, we get it wrong. And a few industries are emitting all this shit. So they are to blame, they say. So maybe this is the oil scene, the age of the oil industry. Maybe this is the polluting age. Maybe this is the car age, or the technology age, or the capitalocene. Let's blame capitalism, right? Capitalism is bad. And it's driving this whole shit and it's never stopping. And we are fucked because of capitalism. There's all these kinds of discussions are going on. And you know like what I like about the Anthropocene concept and word? It's not who's to blame, but it's what my, my friend in pink brought about the change that we can make is on all of us let's stop blaming people and let's stop waiting for those we blame to do something big to stop it and let's all of us try to think and understand and learn here at the boom festival and let's thank every time you get a sip of pure water in all those wells and ask yourself where is this water coming from and how the hell does it get here all the time for me and who did this 
and thank these people because these are people who are learning to live and build in this planet in a way compatible with how life operates. And then I think to the starting question, if we can tune into this kind of stuff and if we can teach this at schools and if we can make it bigger and if we can understand that maybe we don't even need AI, maybe we don't even need machine learning and most likely we don't need geoengineering, we don't need Bill Gates or anybody else or Elon Musk or whoever it is, we don't need folks to put mirrors floating out of the planet to put sunlight away. Because technology has created so many problems and why would we believe that they can manage how much sunlight should come in and how much sunlight should be reflected every single minute while the planet spins and everything's happening on a mind-boggling scale that we're spinning around the sun and spinning around ourselves and everything going on. Right? So let's tune in. Let's tune in to what it means to be alive here, to how we need to walk on this earth. Go to the lake, enjoy here the Boon Lake. And before you go down, look at the land and try to imagine and see how shallow or not is the water. And try to see if you can look at it and capture where does the water comes in into this lake? Where, where is it coming from? That side or that side? Because some folks do know, and we all can drink water here because these folks, they do know. And I've been with indigenous people and they do know, they do know where the water comes from. And now scientists are learning where the water comes from. For you guys to have an idea, I used to live with my wife, she's right there, Marina. We lived eight years in the Atlantic rainforest in the southeast coast of Brazil, the most amazing landscape you can imagine like waterfalls coming down 10 minutes from the ocean like amazing place but we lived on the three percent of what's left three percent 97 is gone it's roads and industry and stuff and still there's so much water and rain heavy rain it breaks our ceilings of our houses because it powers so strong but so strong we we lived in the uk for a while and people were scared of the th thunderstorms in london and we were like guys we never saw rain ever because <laughs> it's so light and soft and why is there so much humidity in the southeast of brazil and in all the center of brazil if you go out of Brazil and you climb the mountains, it's dry, the Andes. And the reason we have so much rain is because of the Amazon. The Amazon is up there, pumping so much water into the atmosphere. And now scientists, my, my dear friends, climatologists, climate scientists, they can measure particles of water in the sky that we can see. They are so tiny, they don't form clouds, so you don't see them. And they are floating in the sky, and now scientists are calling these floating rivers. And these floating rivers, they travel southeast, thousands of kilometers, and they power rain all over. And this is coming from indigenous land, indigenous territory in the Amazon. And Brazil is one of the main exporters of food for the entire planet. Maybe part of what we eat here comes from Brazil. And who is sustaining this rain? Indigenous people. Davis Kopenawa. And when I first read his book and he was talking about the falling sky, I was saying like, this is so dumb. This is, I mean, I admire indigenous people so so much but if like the sky can't fall the sky is not a dome it's not a structure 
it can't collapse. And then I wake up the next day and I'm like, yeah, there was a hurricane in Mozambique, it ravaged the whole place. The sky can fall. The sky can fall really strong. Really strong. So let's try to understand what these people are trying to do. Indigenous people now, they live in territories in this planet which make about 25% of the land in the entire planet. Australia, New Zealand, Asia, Gabon, South Africa, those countries in the north, like, you know, like the polar cap, North America, South America. You put everybody together, you sum everything up, it's 25% of the land. And they are keeping almost 80% of the biodiversity alive. It's the reverse. We have 75% of the land and 25% of the biodiversity. We pretty much live just among ourselves. Cats and dogs, and maybe somebody has another creature in their homes. <laughs> right? So, my understanding these days is that when Davi is saying that the last shamans in the Amazon are sustaining the sky. They really are. And that if we drive things to a point where a shaman cannot survive anymore by fishing and hunting in the sacred territories in the Amazon and elsewhere, we will be over, way over the 1.5 or 2.5 whatever it is Celsius target of the International Panel on Climate Change and Greta Thunberg's fight, right? We should stay below 1.5. We're most likely above that already. And, and what are we going to leave to our kids, right? So we got to protect these lands. We got to care for the land. We got to understand the water. We got to understand the flow of life in the planet, in the place. Please do this at Boom while you walk around the next days and nights. Try to understand. Every time you see an art around, check it out. It's most of the time, as I could see, near a water well. And these people know what they're doing. So I'm really, really grateful to be here at Boom, to be invited to this conversation with you guys, to see so many beautiful people here aligning, entering in contact with your inner space or wherever the Shapiri are. And if you see crazy things and colorful, maybe our Shapiri dancing their mirrors and dance with them and play them, pray for them to protect us so we can keep safe and we can have many more, more booms under 50 Celsius. Thank you, folks. Thanks for that. Um, I shifted lenses a few times during the talk. Synthetic puritanism is one that jumps out, and uh, and colliding cosmologies. Um, my my personal problem is that like I operate in a Caucasian existential vibe, which yeah. is really disconnected from the environment. I was a city kid. And so even when I tap into that place and I will go the extra mile and go into personal sacrifice in order to not fuck up the environment more, I quickly slip back into my old patterns mm -hmm. very fast because I was raised in them. Um, and that's why it feels really daunting to shift because it it's a does. constant practice to enter that kind of state. Yeah. <sighs> <sighs> thank you, Ivan. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, thoughts? Um, Inspirations, dreams, yes. That's how you put a hand up. <laughs> I was wondering, what do you think about overpopulation? Yeah. It just screams to me that, like, what do we do? I mean, we've gotten this far just because of it. And it's really great that indigenous people are keeping these traditions, but it's 
just because they live in the most prosperous territories there is in the planet. And um, what do you think about it? Thank you. That's, that's one of the hardest questions I think I can think of. Um, and I don't have the clear answer, but I've gone through it over the years a few times. And one of my favorite writers about it is one of the best writers about psychedelics as well, Aldous Huxley. And before having psychedelics, which by the way, Aldous only started having psychedelics, he was over 50 years old. He was already a very good, uh, a well-known author, writer, and, and so on. He was very worried about population, right? Overpopulation, and that the problem would be too many people on the planet. And that may be it, but overpopulation is also kind of uh, tricky, dangerous, because it, it gave us eugenie, the idea that you should choose a few or some blessed, smarter, whiter, whatever it is, kind of folks, and just let the rest, you know, like, die sooner so that the rest could enjoy. But when we go to these kind of, like, George Bush, Echo 92 sentences, like, our way of life is non-negotiable. I like to prefer, it's, a, it's an option, it's a, it's, a, it's a current choice at the moment, at the last years of my life. I like to prefer and, and believe that it is possible for 7, 8, 9, 12 billion people if we stop chasing the American dream, if we awake from that, and if we want less and if we buy less. There are all kinds of less that we can talk about. To me, it's kind of, how, how do I fly here, right? We're, we're taking planes, there is something. We could calculate how much Boom Festival emits to fly everybody over, right? But then again, take care with the calculations. I was worried that uh, by the start of the pandemic, I was like, I don't want to fly anymore. I'm feeling too guilty about flying. And I have two kids and you know, like how, how, am, I, how, how am I doing this? How am I joining this and, and being part of it? And then I started studying it. And when you look at the, the math, it's an exponential curve. It's like this. We all, we summed everybody, is this tiny emission with all our flights. And then you have these billionaires and they emit like 97% of the shit. F making three minute flights from one city to another in the US and Europe. And then we have all kinds of discussions of outlawing these flights and controlling how much and so on and doing politics, right? And like there's, there's, a, there's so much that you can fly in your life and after that it's over. So calculate, you know, when, when you're 20, you, you could get a flying degree. Now you can fly, you're, you're over 20 and you have, I don't know, 10, 100 flights in your life. Choose well, right? So let's be really careful not to blame overpopulation. Because blaming overpopulation is kind of, I think, my opinion, is kind of spreading about the guilt and saying we are all guilty and we are hopeless because we are too many. And what can we do? Maybe we could do like the Chinese and impose like one children per couple. And I, I mean, they kind of did it and, and they had pros and cons about it. but. It's very, very careful with that, I, that, that issue. The issue is really, really complicated. We don't really know. I, I don't really know if we can continue. Like, we are seven, maybe eight billion already. I, I don't really know. It changes so fast, right? It's, our, it's again, exponential, right? So in, in a few years, in three or four editions of Boom, it's be so many millions more. This number is constantly changing. But again, it depends, I think, a lot on our way of life. And, and we all can do a part. And, and that's what I love about the, the Swedish young Greta Thunberg 
and all her friends and other folks from other countries, South American, German, and others, they're realizing no one is too small to make a difference. And we should all contribute, and we should all get this fight for real. And what the IPCC says, the International Panel for Climate Change, is that we got to change a lot of stuff to 2030. How many booms is that? Two? Three? Four? Is it every year now? Well, We're it depends, uh, depends how many we do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got another question here, if you want to stand up. Where? Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you for your talk. Amazing. Um, thank you. What I wanted to ask you is, uh, how do you think we can change the lie that we've been told about psychedelics and maybe change the narrative so that the substances and the medicine is not feared, but welcomed and connect us more with our planet? Thank you. That's a... Um it's a very dear topic, very, very dear topic in a very, very special place. The conversation is for sure rapidly changing. I'm part of that, a small part. Uh, I won't go into that a lot, but I was part of the first team who did neuroimaging of humans under LSD. I had LSD in my veins and I had scans of my own brain under LSD in London, an official study. I'm involved in multiple studies and partnerships in this world that folks are now calling the psychedelic renaissance. And, but I think the psychedelic renaissance is too much of a title. It's, it's, a, it's an honor that the movement's not quite there yet. Because the Renaissance historically was a movement about art, culture, spirituality, engineering, mathematics, what we nowadays call science, everything. A kind of change in you know, outlook and thinking and, and getting through and past our dichotomies. Like that's religion, this is science, we can't talk about together, right? And I think that's, kind of di direction I wanted to see things go more often than it's going right now with, when we're seeing a lot of investment in private corporations. One of them claimed that they own psilocybin. They patented psilocybin. They say it's theirs. Oh, okay, there are tiny details. It's just one form of the crystal st structure of psilocybin and we're not gonna, you know, let anybody else, we're not gonna mess with mushroom eaters, but the marketing of psilocybin for the sick, for the depressed people, they want to claim monopoly, right? So it's a kind of critical juncture we're at. And I think part of the answer to your very important question is not be afraid of connecting science, spirituality, culture, party, sacred, technology and let's look at it and the other part and maybe the most important one is that we all we kind of psychonauts boomers people who trip who use these substances who go to rituals who travel around who help indigenous people we gotta understand that people who don't will not understand us by verbal speech, speech and discussion. It's like by embodying and walking differently and living differently and relating differently and being kinder and being friendlier and bring, bringing more gentleness to things and helping other folks more. If more and more people start to see that folks, let's say, who take psychedelics act differently, then I think we're on a good path. Now, if it's a lot of talk about utopian psychedelia, then maybe we're getting lost in illusions. All right, we got time for one more. Okay, who puts their hand at the highest? <laughs> uh, 
Hey. Hey. Um, thanks for your talk. Thank uh, you. So you titled it Indigenous Wisdom and Psychedelic Science, and I'm wondering if you have uh, anything more to say about uh, Indigenous Wisdom in Psychedelic Science or your thoughts about like uh, how, because there's a, a rising concern, right, with, uh, as we've heard, buzzwords like decolonized science or decolonized psychedelics or indigenized psychedelics, right? Um, uh, I think indigenization is maybe more appropriate. But uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you have thoughts about um, that. I hear in Mexico, for example, there is uh, research now being done on psychedelics with ritual as a variable, without ritual as a variable. So um, I, I'm uh, you know, yeah. learning a little bit about this, but I, I'd like to hear from you if you have more to say about that. That's a very nice point. Ivan, how, how long do I have? Two minutes? Cool. <laughs> How can I do that <laughs> in two minutes? It's the uh, it's the TikTok version. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm involved in that. Um, a few years ago, I got involved in a project with Czech scientists from Prague. Eva, are you here? Yay! So Eva is part of this beautiful project. We are on our way, and we were kind of delayed by COVID. But we were, and are, we're still now kind of returning on our way to do EEGs, which is to record brain waves from people having ayahuasca in the Amazon in sacred rituals of the Hunikuin people, right there. And it's a controversial project. Some people think and say that we are colonizing again, going there and saying that only we can explain what's going on, but we think differently. We think we are decolonizing the thing, and they think as well. And these were, two, I have two minutes, one is probably gone, and we had two years just engaging with indigenous people, many travelings, and Eva was there with me, we were having ayahuasca together in the Amazon with these guys, and we brought some EGs to show them what an EG is for them to understand if the EG would kind of disrupt their, you know, prayings and doings and whatever it is, it is they do in their rituals. But they can use EGs and the feathers on top and there's no problems. <laughs> and they were like, yeah, this is interesting. We don't really understand why you want to look into the brain because we don't think it's in the brain. And the brain is the part of the hunt that nobody wants to eat and the brain doesn't matter. But if you want to study the brain and we want to engage with us and make more people are aware of our medicine, let's try to do some stuff together. So there's lots of stuff together, uh, uh, lots, lots of stuff happening right now. And then one last point is that I was super happy a few weeks before Boom. I was invited to review a paper for a scientific journal written by eight different indigenous people from eight different places and traditions, establishing indigenous guidelines for psychedelic research. And this is to come out soon. And they come with eight R's, the letter R, because it's eight concepts that start with R, like reciprocity and others. And this is coming out soon to help, we hope, guide psychedelic science to not lose itself on being too materialistic and reductionistic. Land devoid. Devoid of land reference. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, man. Is that uh, it? Uh, <laughs>